The Biden administration has put in a formal request to Congress for nearly $106 billion in aid for both Israel and Ukraine, and that includes both military and humanitarian support. The president making his case to the American people last night in a speech in which he said that both of these efforts are vital for American security. American leadership is what holds the world together. American alliances are what keep us, America, safe. American values are what make us a partner that other nations want to work with. To put all that at risk, if we walk away from Ukraine, if we turn our backs on Israel, it's just not worth it. We want to focus in on the Israeli uh, conflict in particular. And for that, we bring in Ian Bremmer. He is founder and CEO of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for being with us. So to talk about Israel first in particular, um, and I know you've been thinking a lot about this, writing a lot about this. What is the possible path to a resolution at this point? Uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. The Israelis are about to begin a ground invasion of Gaza within uh, hours, if not days. The United States would like them uh, to not do that. Uh, because it's going to lead to enormous civilian casualties and greater radicalization. Uh, but uh, understandably, uh, the Israeli government, and here I'm not just talking about Netanyahu, but the broader war cabinet, um, are uh, responding emotionally uh, and with a focus of retribution, uh, given the worst violence uh, that the Jews have faced in the world since the Holocaust. So, I mean, it's it reminds me of a couple weeks before the Russians invaded Ukraine and we all knew it was coming. The U.S. had the intelligence. We were trying to convince the Russians this was a really big mistake. They shouldn't do it. And they did it. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of this feeling of inevitable. Now, in this case, I mean, it's not an enemy of the United States. It's a friend of the United States. But the feeling is the same, that a big mistake is about to be made that is going to have long term implications. The Americans would like to prevent it, but it's not going to be prevented. Uh, and so we're not on a path towards resolution We're we're trying we're in a defensive crouch to try to stop what is an expanding war from engulfing the entire Middle East. And Ian, what what is Iran's role in this conflict? And do you think there's a chance that they could be more directly involved? Or do you think, no, they simply stay involved through their proxies, Hamas and Hezbollah? Uh, fortunately, uh, this is, uh, so far at least, this has been one of the better pieces of news. The likelihood that the Iranians get directly involved in the war is low. I say that's good news, especially because that's the one thing that would really affect the American economy. It'd be $150 oil. It'd be a global recession. It's probably Trump becomes president in 2025. So there are a lot of consequences, a lot at stake if the Iranians are directly involved in this war. Now, U.S. intelligence so far shows that the Iranians were quite surprised by the Hamas attacks, both the timing and the extent. Um, and uh, not only do the Americans accept that, but critically, the Israelis accept that. So they don't believe the Iranians were orchestrating these attacks. Having said that, the Iranians have provided financing for Hamas consistently military support for Hamas consistently and training. And without those three things, Hamas would not have been able to engage in these attacks. So, I mean, the Iranians are certainly complicit um, in, in what's happened, and they are very strongly on Hamas's side. Uh, they, they also have called for genocide. They've called for the end of the Zionist regime um, in ways that are inhuman, uh, but nonetheless kind of par for the course for Supreme Leader Khamenei. Now, of course, there are other implications for the region besides whether Iran gets more directly involved, including what had been budding normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And now Hamas's attack seems to have, for now, put that on ice. Do you think that that is salvageable? Um, it's clearly off the table for the foreseeable future, because part of the deal was that the Palestinians were going to get, if not a two-state solution, at least some level of window dressing, you know, better economic opportunity, something that the Saudis could point to that was a part of this normalization that, yeah, they got something for the Palestinians. 
you just blew the windows out. There's no window dressing coming, right? So that that's inconceivable for the time being, and certainly with Netanyahu as prime minister right now. Um, but the Saudis came out yesterday and they made, a, a, I would say for them, a pretty balanced statement that was critical of Israel, but also condemned Hamas terrorism. Um, and and I have seen from the Saudis in their bilateral relations with the United States over the past week, um, a strong desire uh, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, to maintain a stable relationship with the U.S. and keep informal conversations going, even with the Israelis. So um, this is this is definitely dead for now. Uh, but I don't think the relationship, uh, the informal relationship, is completely broken. And Ian, what are the chances do you think that the U.S. military gets more actively involved in this conflict, either with hostage rescue in Gaza or even in Lebanon? I think with hostage rescue, they will not, uh, you know, despite the fact that there are 11 citizens that we know are presently being held hostage in Gaza, though we don't know how many of them are alive. Um, the, the White House has made clear uh, that the Israelis are in the lead. They are the ones that are taking the decisions, all of the decisions on hostage rescue. Um, and at least from their public statements, the Israeli government um, has been talking about getting leveling all the tunnels, destroying all the Hamas capabilities, and that they won't be responsible for what's on the ground. Uh, and you know that that means that these hostages are going to be at greater risk. Certainly, that's true as soon as you have ground forces that come into Gaza from Israel. Now, the United States has sent two aircraft strike carrier groups um, into the Eastern Med. Uh, and that is a very strong and direct message to others in the region that the Americans will directly respond militarily if the U.S. is attacked. Um, and we've already seen drone strikes against American bases in Iraq, for example. We've seen some drone strikes that might well be attacks on American ships. The, the possibility that the United States is directly involved in this war in at least a minimum way, I think, is reasonably high. Again, that's very different from the U.S. is at war with Iran. But, you know, in the case of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the United States made very, very clear red lines that they're going to provide a lot of support for the Ukrainians, but there will be no direct NATO fighting against the Russians. Uh, in the Middle East, that is a very, very different story. I think that there is an absolute expectation that there are plenty of things that could happen going forward that would bring the Americans directly involved in fighting. Um, Ian, you mentioned the ground invasion, and of course, the Israelis have warned Palestinian civilians in Gaza to move to the south. It's been, what, almost a week at this point, and there has not yet yeah. been a ground invasion. Do you think that that is a, a factor of international pressure? Do you think it's strategic? What do you think is going on there? Yeah, a, a few things. So first of all, uh, when the uh, October 7th events first occurred, the terrorist attacks, um, Netanyahu, it was on his watch. He's immensely unpopular. Everyone in Israel blames him for taking his eye off the ball, border security, intelligence, you name it. Um, and so he needed to put together an emergency unity war cabinet um, that has experience and that would reflect the will of the entire Israeli people. And that took him about a week to put together. So it, you first needed to have a government that was gonna be responsible for fighting the war. And, and Netanyahu understandably did not want to order a ground defensive until he had the cabinet in place that was gonna make those decisions. That's number one. Number two, once that was done, the US government was going to send Biden over. And if you're Netanyahu and the US is your one ally that you can truly count on, um, you are not going to start a ground war in the 48 hours before Biden shows up or while he's there. So you had to get through those two hurdles. Um, and now that Biden is gone, um, I expect uh, that uh, the ground war will start at any moment. Uh, I, I, I'd be quite surprised if we go another week and we haven't had a ground invasion. And Ian, you mentioned how the Iranian regime supports Hamas, supports them financially, supports them militarily. Do you right. think this conflict, Ian, now changes how the Biden administration is going to approach that Iranian regime moving forward? It already has. Uh, let's keep in mind the United States has already reneged on two deals with the Iranians 
that the Iranians were actually uh, fully compliant with. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure the Iranians are going to trust the Americans going forward. I know that probably doesn't bother anybody. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, the Iranians were in the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear deal, and they were in full compliance, according to uh, Trump's Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and then Mike Pompeo. And then the Americans unilaterally withdrew. By the way, all the other signatories uh, told the Americans not to. Then Biden uh, said, we're going to give you six billion dollars of your assets. We'll unfreeze them for humanitarian use through Qatar. Um, and in return, the Iranians uh, freed five American citizens um, who were being held prisoner illegally in Iran. Uh, so they let the citizens go. They're now safely in the United States. And then the U.S. reneged on the deal, six billion, because, you know, they're like, well, we can't give any money to the Iranians because of look what Hamas just did. Look at the pressure they're under. But best I can tell, the Americans are not planning on returning those five citizens to Iran. Right. I mean, I don't I don't think anyone's calling for that. So, I mean, th this is already the effort to try to normalize relations between the United States and Iran, which, by the way, has been successful between Saudi Arabia and Iran. The Chinese got that done. That that looks much more problematic now. And, and the question is, what are the Iranians going to do to the U.S.? I mean, is it is it more likely that they use their proxies to engage in strikes against American military targets in the region? I think it's more likely. Is it more likely they engage in higher levels of uranium enrichment and stockpiling? It's more likely, though that creates more tensions with other countries in the region and with the Chinese that don't really like what the Iranians were doing on that front. So, I mean, they're angry um, and and in some ways rightfully angry, but but they don't really have a lot of, of room for maneuver. And, and that's fortunate. So, Ian, um, let me then take it to President Biden here. Um, given that decision that you just discussed on the part of the administration, given his performance and his reaction thus far to what's going on in Israel and the Palestinian territories. Do you think he's done, for lack of a better word, a good job so far? Um, I, I think that he is enormously constrained in what he can accomplish. Um, so do I think he's done a good job? If you If you judge whether he's done a good job by whether I personally am aligned with the stuff he said in his speech last night, you ran some of it right before this interview, then I would say, yes, I think he's generally in the right place in terms of the policies he's trying to affect. If you ask, is he doing a good job on the basis of the outcomes? The answer is not necessarily. Um, and on a couple of different fronts, remember, you know, Biden is the one that said just a few months ago that the United States will do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to help Ukraine. Um, and I mean, that was not really super credible even at the time, though the U.S. has done a lot with its allies heretofore. But the speech that you and I saw Biden give last night was not a whatever it takes speech. It was a defensive speech. It was a we, everybody like we're in danger of of leaving these guys behind and we need to approve this hundred billion dollar deal and we don't have a speaker of the house right now and the republicans are more opposed to providing more support on ukraine and the dems are more opposed to providing more support on israel and i want to keep us going well i mean ultimately like you know leadership is not just about saying the right policy it's also about executing and and biden is in great danger of not being able to execute here uh, and and ultimately american allies will not be able to count on the Americans if they can't, if they don't feel like they can rely on what the Americans say will be something that's executed on. And American adversaries will think that they can, they'll, they'll have a much greater room to roam. I mean, look, the last two weeks have been the best weeks for Putin since he invaded Ukraine a year and a half ago to almost two years ago. Uh, that's, I, I, I'm not happy to say that, but that's a reality. Uh, he has he has a lot better path at this point to be able to secure territorial gains that he has illegally seized from the Ukrainians. What are we going to do about that? It's not clear what we're going to do about that. Um, and so I I do worry that, you know, the well, of course, the days of America's role as global policemen are 
are behind us. Uh, I mean, I, I'm the guy that coined, after all, a G0 world over a decade ago, not a G7, not a G20. So this is what happens when you have an absence of global leadership, when the Americans are not capable or willing, but nobody else can step in their, their shoes. I mean, what we are seeing is that if the Americans don't play the role to support the Ukrainians militarily, they will lose. Um, and if the Americans don't stand up for Israel, uh, the Israelis will lose, right? I mean, and that's that's a real challenge, especially when a lot of Americans are saying they're not really interested in doing that. And Ian, we know Biden requesting <coughs> $105 billion in new funding for Ukraine and Israel. Ian, can that happen, though, if we continue to have this drama in D.C.? Can it happen if the House doesn't have a speaker? It can't happen without a speaker. Um, you can have a temporary speaker that is empowered um, and puts it to a vote, but they have to put it to a vote. Um, and uh, I, I can't see a hundred billion plus getting approved. I could see a much smaller bill getting approved. But again, I, I want to be clear. You know what we are. Three weeks ago, we were talking about the next tranche for Ukraine, and three months ago, we were talking about whatever it takes for Ukraine. Absolutely, we stand by you. Now we're saying. We've got to give money to Ukraine, and the only way we can get it done is if we also give money to Israel and Taiwan and border security. And we've got to kind of come up with some kind of deal, because otherwise we know it's not going to happen. This is a defensive position. This is not a whatever it takes position. This is uh, if you're if you're the Ukrainians watching what's happening right now, you do not feel confident that you will ever be able to launch another counteroffensive. If you're the Europeans you do not feel confident that the Americans are gonna lead the NATO coalition to ensure that the Ukrainians can take back all of the land that has been seized by Russia since a year ago, February 24th. Um, and and you know, even if you are Israel, it is not clear that the Americans are really going to stand by you for the long haul. Um, and, and that obviously is a, uh, is, is a very disconcerting position for people that are relying heavily on the Americans, some of whom have no choice. Well, and as you're speaking, it feels like a disconcerting position for the globe and its security more broadly, Ian. I mean, you're painting a pretty, a pretty dark picture here in what you're saying. So what do the next few months look like then? I mean, for the safety of the globe, for markets, for that matter, for global economies, I mean, it feels like there's gonna have to be some spillover here. Well, it's strong dollar, right? I mean, America first as a concept in part comes from the fact that the United States geostrategically is located between Canada, Mexico, and two big bodies of water. So, I mean, the Middle East blows up and a lot of that becomes a big problem for uh, governments in the region and spill over into Europe. Russia invades Ukraine. If that goes badly, Think about the money that the Europeans will have to spend on defense at a time when uh, the military consequences are fighting against higher debt servicing. They're fighting high um, against uh, greater inflation and they have higher input costs for energy um, and they have all of these challenges um, in terms of asymmetric attacks from Russia. Well, what about the United States? Seems like a good place to invest. So I do think there's going to be spillover. I do think the market consequences will be significant, but investors are going to look at that uh, as comparatively U.S. is the better call. Ian Bremmer, thank you so much for your time and your insight today, Ian. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Be good.